about Susan that drew you to her? Oh, thanks so much, Michelle. Um, yeah, I won't take long because I know we're eager to get on to the demo, but I first met Susan about 20 years ago. Uh, at, when I lived in Colorado, I took a workshop with her and immediately fell in love with her teaching style and her paintings. I have three of them behind me there, but you can't see the details. Um, I went to France with her uh, for about 10 days. And when I was done with that, I truly saw the world as an artist and not just the things that I was seeing before I went. I've taken other workshops from her. Um, I'm just excited she's here. She is such a talented artist. She's a very supportive teacher and an all around lovely person. So Susan, thanks so much for coming and everybody enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, and thank you, Michelle. And uh, I enjoyed sitting in on everyone's reports. Uh, you're making me homesick for Montana, where we had an, a large art group and um, kind of isolated here. There are groups, but they're south of us. So anyway, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I have, as Michelle said, I planned a demo for you uh, to help you think outside of the box. Now, the interesting thing is as I sat here and listened to everybody talk about the different events and the different artists and everything, I thought, ah, this is one group that really does love thinking outside of the box. So I might be um, preaching to the choir here tonight, but um, I want to reignite you into the process of starting at the beginning and uh, I'll be right there, man. getting the emotion out of uh, the subject. Because the truth of the matter is we are, um, we're writers, we're authors, we're actors, and we do it all with our brush. You know, it's this brush that is our words and our expression. And uh, we're very privileged to be able to do it because it's a universal language. You know, everybody can understand paintings. They may not want to understand the paintings, <laughs> but they can feel. And that's, that's what I wanna uh, stress tonight. Um, so first of all, I am going to show you some of the supplies before I get into it. Uh, I have been using a round palette for years. Uh, and I'm going to, let's switch to my palette window. Okay. That, okay. Um, I've been using a palette like this. And forgive me, I don't remember the name of the person that made it. But it gives you a lot of paint it's if you lay it out like a color wheel you've got your um, colors that blend nicely together you've got your complementary colors that can create um, muting um, it's a wonderful palette plus you've got extra um, mixing spots so I use that in my studio all the time but when I'm traveling and that's when I'm going to use one of those tonight when I'm traveling I use this and I went online and tried to find out where I got this, oops, here we go. Um, it's, this is ancient, you can see it's held together with duct tape, but it's a little mini travel palette. Uh, you have space that you can uh, mix on the top here. And it's, again, if you put it in, a, in like a color wheel, you're gonna have your colors that are analogous and those are the neighbors, you know, it get, gets along with the neighbors. And across the tracks are the other side of the neighborhood. And these will mute your colors. So you get the contrast between the vibrant and the muted colors, which is always exciting. So I'm going to put those aside. And I'll show you what my palette, the one I'm going to be using tonight. Oops, I have to get this out of my room here. I think that's so cool that you have your travel palette is actually a color wheel. Um, I know. I, I, I can't believe they aren't making it. So I will research this. And if I find it, I will send it to you. Um, tonight, I'm going to show you the palette that I'm using tonight. And you say, well, wait a minute. What are all those Band-Aids on there? Those aren't Band-Aids. 
this is the palette that I like to use when I force myself to use a semi-limited palette as opposed to all of these colors. So the colors that I sent to you are basically the ones that I have on here. I think I got all of them. Um, and you can see it's again, because it's a color wheel. It's just a natural. These guys are gonna not fight each other. These are gonna fight each other. So if you wanna stay intense, uh, vibrant colors, you stay with the neighborhood, you know, your neighbors. If you want to then contrast it and have dull colors, you're gonna jump across. So that's, I just wanted to tell you about that. Um, I, I mentioned, I don't know if you've got that, the list that said my supply list, plastic cups. Save those, put them in your studio. They're wonderful for making circles. That circle for my crow is that I'm gonna to do tonight. I used one of these uh, little plastic, you know, recycled with the artist. That's what I always say. Um, I don't know that I'll use the salt, but I have it. Uh, I really like the silk salt. It's a large grain bigger than um, kosher salt. They use it for dyeing silk and getting all kinds of patterns. I might be using that. This one, possibly. Now, what in the heck is that? Well, you know, uh, and I was fascinated with, um, oh, I forgot her name. The gal that, that you did a little video. Yes, Juanita Hagberg. Juanita, yes, yes. I was fascinated with uh, the coffee filters. I think that's what she had. Because um, I was going to show you how to take something like this. This is what avocados come in, oranges come in, these things. And you can take these, bunch them up, and you can press them into your watercolors and get uh, an unusual texture. So we'll see if I do that tonight. Um, I do a lot of planning for my paintings. And then I. Um, I'm pretty spontaneous. So what I want to do tonight is to encourage you to go back to planning more, thinking a little bit more before you pick up the brush, put some thought into it and give yourself, ask yourself some questions. So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna give you a little slideshow presentation here. Um, okay, so in other words, if you got a game plan for your next painting, uh, maps, I call them maps, making art artistic plans, M-A-P-S, um, and maps are so left brain, you know, but if I have, if I'm in a strange city and I need to get someplace, I don't just wander out there and try to find where I'm going, which is, believe me, uh, it's fun to do and I'm, I love to do this, but I have realized that if you take the time to start consciously planning your painting ahead of time, whether you write it down or not, it'll start happening faster subconsciously. And with watercolors, it's always a conversation. So I, you still are going to be responding to the crazy thing it just did or the mess that it just made. But if you start out with some planning, and I'll explain that in just a minute here. So here we go. Come on, little computer. There we go. So this is an example of um, thinking ahead of time. Am I going to do, go, do cool to warm? All these colors back in here are cool. This is the warmest part of the painting. That would work. But what if I flipped it and put a really strong warm in the sky, then this becomes a cool warm. And I've got it surrounded by these grays. So, uh, you know, that that's a simple thing to do. But wow, what a difference it makes if I thought it through. Here's another one. Um, values. We were talking about temperature. Now, what about values? Uh, dark to light background's going to be dark and we end up with this light flower. What about light? And eh, this doesn't work as well. Light, 
light in the background, and then we lead to these real dark colors here. I still think this is the focal point. So yeah, I'm kind of fudging it a little bit, but I thought that one through. Oh, no, oh, sorry. I jumped off the wrong way. Let's go back here. Gotta watch what I'm clicking here. Okay, this one. Nope. Come on. You can do it. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. Okay, now that's the same subject matter, but look at the palette. Now this is complementary colors. This is basically a green with a red combination. Yes, I have a little bit of the analogous, analogous color to the red and to the green is a yellow. And over here, it's the same, same painting, but I've got blue to orange. And what I want you to, I'm going to go back actually a little bit. I want you to think about your emotions. This is one emotion, and I'm, quite frankly, I think it's kind of cold. This cool to warm. This one is not cool to warm. It's a, still a wintry day, but it there's more emotion in it, more feeling. Um, and the same thing here. This is a completely feel different feeling because it's dark to light and then light to dark. So this is more moody. And that's so important for you to think about what you want in your paintings. Identify. Very first thing is if you can't write a sentence or write, I look at this and feel, and then because you feel that, that's what you're getting from the subject matter, then you're going to plan your colors, your temperatures, your intensity, your edges, your shapes, you know, that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, here's a good example. My computer, well, come on, you're brand new. Um, there was a lot more color on this little igloo that he was in. And I just decided I was going to go muted to pure. So we've got pure here, and this is the purest anyway, in the, the, uh, in the center, and also light to dark. Now, those are maps. Those are maps. And they work really well. Uh, this is um, lost edges to found edges. You know, this all becomes soft edges to hard edges. No detail to detail. These are wonderful maps that everybody can do. And uh, if you just start in the beginning, I have a dog that's in the middle of a nightmare. Come on, it's okay, Penny, you're okay. No, nope, she's done. Okay, this one is um, abstract to realism. You know, when you look down in here, all of this is abstract uh, and then gets up to realism. And I know a lot of you are doing this, but it's become subconscious to you. And now I want you to get back and make it conscious. Okay, so this is a really uninspiring image, right? Yes. Why do I like it? Well, I like the shape. So if we look at the shape, that's a really interesting shape. And it kind of gives me an expression, a feeling. This was fine. But the background's boring, the color's boring. It's not giving me enough feeling. So the shape, we're going to keep that. Start with that. And what if, what if we put a, bit, a bluish background in, what, and then a circle, a feeling of a moon or a sun or something? So you keep asking your quest, yourself questions. Are there any shapes I could add to make it stronger? And I chose a moon or a sun. What I could have shown a, a branch of a tree or a, a silhouette of a farmhouse or the actual mountains. Um, what emotion do I want this painting to be? Well, if I wanted it to be peaceful, this is kind of a nice, gentle, peaceful feeling. Now, this is not a painting. I'm just saying this is, um, instead of me just describing what I want, you to think about, it's easier for me to give you a visual. It, you'll, it'll stick with you better. What do I need to do if I want the painting to be peaceful? You've got to ask yourself, what color is peaceful? What edges are peaceful? Soft edges. And, I, and you can see down in here, they're getting soft. 
What values are p peaceful? Low contrast. Yeah, well, does that really mean that's peaceful? Maybe I have to even go lighter, but I've kept the value. Remember, this is a black crow. I've really changed the values on that. This is fun stuff. Um, I actually, come on, you can do it. Here we go. There we go. So I decided, well, what if I went from peaceful to happy? One of the ways I could do that was add a complementary color. And what do I know about complementary colors? When you put them together, they dull them. We've been talking about that. But if you put them next to each other, they vibrate. Uh, our cones and our rods are separate. And complementary colors are either on a cone or a rod. And the two of them are vibrating and we get a little thrill. That's why Christmas is red and green. Easter is yellow and purple. Uh, Mexican fiestas are all these greens and reds and you know exciting colors. So even with this, we're getting a little bit of uh, vibration. And I'm engaging the viewer's mind by dissolving the edges. I've got lost and found. I'm just telling enough. I'm, be I'm being an artist of mystery. Sometimes we work so hard to get it just perfect when actually if we said less, the painting would be better. Okay, so what if we wanted to go from happy to festive? Well, I brought the intensity of the color up. This is a, getting closer to a pure color. This is getting a little bit brighter. And I strengthened the value just a little bit. Okay, now how about a dreamlike expression? So I really have softened the edges and I brought in this weird green. It's not a sky color, but it's a weird green. So it kind of gives you a feeling, at least I get a feeling of like, maybe it's a dream. Um, and you can see at the bottom, I've got a little bit of lavender and then it goes up into the oranges and then it goes up into the greens. Very dreamy, calm. Uh, it's coming. There we go. But wait, have I tried flipping it? You know, a lot of times if you're looking at something, especially if you're working on, don't try flipping your models if they're live. That doesn't, they don't like that. But <laughs> if you um, flip uh, a photo, hold it up to the light and look at backwards. Oh yeah, that would work. I like that better. Then, then you can print it out backwards um, if that's what you're if you're working from a photo uh, and I flipped this one and went oh wow that feels so much better we as uh, people that speak English we read from left to right so that's why when we look at paintings we enter from the left side we're just used to that if you walk down a hallway in a crowded hallway because we drive on the right side of the road, we always walk on the right side of the hallway if there's more than two people coming down the hallway, right? Well, it's the same thing here. I was in China and they, for you know, centuries and centuries, sorry, thousands of years, their art went up and down because that's the way they read their Chinese. Then um, about, I can't remember how many years ago, 20, I think, they decided they were going to change it to read from left to right. And their artists are now doing horizontal paintings, long and skinny, or, and they read from left to right. If you go to Israel or you go to Pakistan, um, they read from right to left and their artwork reads more like, go on, you can do it, go on, this. So you can imagine if you're used to reading right, you come right in and you settle on this. That's why it didn't feel so good. And that's why this feels better. Because our viewer will enter, come right along with diagonals are good for directing stuff, right along here and bingo. Then I sweetened the pot with that circle. Um, and you feel it's singing a song now. A Couple more and we're done. So let's try expanding the color combination instead of just the, the um, colors we had. How about adding some 
yellow in here, yellow green. We're getting a little different stuff in here. Experimenting, what feeling is that giving me the feeling I want? And then we'll flip it again. And now I've got the colors, the values. I'm, I'm expressing a feeling that I wanting. And uh, I think I'll call it noisy morning song just out my side my window. Now, I want you to understand this is not showing strokes or what watercolors can do. I am just laying out the foundation for the colors and shapes, but colors mainly. The rest comes real soon. So what did we come across? Let's recap here. Uh, you know that um, painting, painting, on, or mirror, mirror on the wall. This is painting, painting on my easel. How do I love thee? How do I paint thee? Let me count the waves. Do I feel something? Do I like the shapes? Do I like the colors? All of these will help you when if you just take a minute to look at your painting. How about uh, peaceful with blue? That was that first one. And then the second one, we added the complement, so it's a little bit warmer, and we lost some edges. See down in here? How about, I'm going to make this bigger. Yeah. How about uh, adding green and red? Okay. And are these the feelings I'm wanting? Flip it. Oh, now I'm feeling the message. Try again. What about blue, yellow, purple? Flip it. Decide what feeling you want to express. Finally, the strokes. Am I going to be wet into wet? Am I going to be dry brush? Am I going to have loose strokes? Maybe loose strokes around the head? What about textures, wet into wet, saran wrap, plastic netting textures? Um, these are early decisions that if you just take time, and don't be in a hurry, your, feel, your painting will have a more powerful emotion because you're not um, bushwhacking yourself with uh, ideas that aren't there. Okay, so now, I'm going to take those ideas and I'm going to show you, you, some of you may work with a computer and you can do this in Photoshop, but for decades, I did little value studies in color with these kind of ideas. So for instance, now these are what you call studies. They're not meant to be finished paintings. If I had a lot of time, I could have done these with finished paintings, but I just wanted to see if I was going to like the colors once I saw this. Okay. So this is, this is the picture right there. And maybe this is how I'm going to interpret it. These are the colors that I'm using for this one. I did throw in a little yellow there. What about the next one down here? Well, again, these are not finished paintings to say the least. Um, they're just giving me an idea of how these colors are gonna work together. Do I like that? What about, and you notice I have all of them flipped going, so we read this way. What about the last one? Oh, something's going on. Now, I was using paper that's Canson, and um, it's a real slick paper. I was fascinated with Upo. I've only worked with that a couple times. That has, it, it doesn't just talk to you. It shouts, it giggles, it does all kinds of stuff. But I got done doing these three, and I said, I don't think I want to use this paper for this painting. So the next, and that, this was from... This watercolor XL uh, aqua. It, it was and it, sometimes it does fun things, but not this time. I didn't like it. So then I got out. I'm gonna take this away. I got out my crusty dusty. You know, I'm old school. I started with arches and um, there are a lot of papers that I do like, but I keep going back to cold pressed arches and I love it. I, I love some English papers and other things, but anyway, so this is the fourth one. Remember this guy? 
And on this paper, it seemed to be responding to me in a way that felt like what I wanted to do. And I really like this. As a matter of fact, that could be a finished little painting the way it is. But let's see what the last one was. Oh, and those were the colors. Those were the colors for this one. See that? I like to put the colors together and see how they are going to flow. That's all the thinking process. And then this last one is this kind of a thing. It was a takeoff on what my thinking was going, how my thinking was going. Okay. So this is what I'm thinking. Although in the process, I don't like all these extra rings. It's a little too science fiction for me. I don't know. And, yeah, they could they could work. Okay. So now I'm gonna paint it. I know you've been waiting all this time. You're finally getting the demo. Okay. Um I have my painting taped off. I'm gonna put my glasses on it and find them. It's a problem with glasses. Oh, I heard there's something now out that you can put a little thing on whatever it is, your keys, your glasses, your phone, a little tiny thing, and you can find it. So I got to do that. Okay, here we go. So um, this is one of those places where I use, not that one, this one, this one, no, no, yes. I drew around it. Um, I don't like using a compass because I'm going to end up with a hole and that's going to take in some paint. So I just save, save all different sizes of lids. Um, it's a vitamin lid, you know, if I want to do other things. You can also, when the, paint, the paper is wet, if you want to press real hard, you'll actually get an, a bruise in a circle. This is kind of cool. That's what I did on that other study, so I'll put this aside. So I've done, in theory, all my thinking. I know I want to have a yellowy-orange band right through here. The moon's going to be kind of orangey. Um, blue up in here that kind of starts becoming green because of the yellow, but just very subtle. And then I, a magenta down in here. Now, one of the things that I did not like about the bird is he's just too profile. So I found another bird. Here we go. And he's slightly turned toward me, almost in the same position, slightly turned toward me. I can see inside his mouth. He's got a little bit more interest in the feathers. And uh, I'm going to use him as uh, inspiration. So here we go. And my brushes I am addicted to this brush. This is a dagger, half inch dagger. And um, when I first, my sister Karen is, Karen Vance is an artist also. And uh, she gave me this brush one time when I was demonstrating. And of course I didn't know how to use it. And I started using it. It was like getting in a car for the first time. Ugh, it was all over the place. This has become my favorite brush. When I travel, I bring two of them just in case I lose one, because that's all I need. I can be a point and do a little tiny detail. I can be a wide and I can do everything in between. So stop talking and do it. Okay. Oh, the other thing I want to tell you is uh, toilet paper. And um, it's good to have when you're in a foreign country, you never know, but um, it's wonderful for sucking the moisture out of your brush. You just touch it and it's gone. Um, I sometimes will paint with a sponge, a wet sponge and the toilet paper. This takes it out completely, really dries it. Instead of holding it and then getting a new paper towel and all that, this is really fast. The sponge will take a little bit of water out, but not everything. So I didn't want to complicate that tonight. 
Um, let's see, I am going to start, I like to start with my lightest colors and my warmest colors. So my lightest color on this is the yellow and the oranges, some orange in here. And um, that's light and that's warm. This is warm too. So I'm gonna start in through here, get this down because the other colors are gonna come on top of it. Oh, and my iPad just fell, just a second. There we go, come back, all right. Okay. Everybody back in line, here we go. And I'm going to start with, this is another brush that's really cool. I don't know if you remember Judy Betts. I don't know if it's still around, but it's uh, two brushes in one, which I think is really neat. This has a great point, and this is a great flat. So I think I'm going to start, nah, nah, I want to start with this guy, nah. I can cover more ground with this. All right, yellow. So I am going, I'm looking at this yellow and it's a warm yellow. And that's why I like cadmium yellow pale. Not light, light, light is very cold. Um, I'll show you the difference. So this is light. See how much colder that is? See how this has a little bit of red in it. Um, if you're mixing, uh, some colors won't work very well with it, like purple will kind of go, uh, well, yellow and purple anyway, um, but green always goes really well with it. Um, reds, this this will work with some reds, it doesn't work so well with um, alizarin crimson, but this works really good with alizarin crimson. So, I'm going to uh, go ahead and. Well, could you repeat what the yellow is that you're using? I'm using cadmium yellow pale. Okay, thanks. And it's a, uh, hmm, I, I, I want to say a Windsor Newton color, but I think everybody has it now. When I started, there weren't a lot of choices you know, for the color companies. Now, my gosh, they figured it out that we love color and we'll buy brushes. We're gold mines for these uh, manufacturers. <laughs> Just great, bring them on, I, I love these things. So already I'm getting a, a feeling on this that I, I really like. So now I'm gonna introduce a tiny bit of cad red light. Cad red light is not as deep as cad um, red. And I'm gonna just let introduce this into here, let it just bleed on up a little bit. Oh, I was gonna erase that. Maybe I can wiggle it out. Pencil lines usually will wiggle out. If you get all done with the painting and it's darn, I forgot to erase that pencil and it looks terrible, wait two days. Let it dry really good for two days. And then you can come back and, uh, or a week if you want, and you can erase and that pencil will lift right off. But if you try to erase it while it's wet, you will be sorry because it'll chew up the paper. It doesn't, and it doesn't lift, but it lets go, believe it or not, after some time. I had no idea. Yep. That's a great tip. <laughs> yeah, and that's, it's so important to know that because a lot of times it's that pencil that, and I had to put the pencil on so that you could see it. Otherwise you would not really know what the heck I was doing. A little blue in here. Now I would like some lights in that. So I have choices I can take toilet paper or paper towel. And I can lift some of this out and I can roll it. And sometimes I'll get enough of a texture. I like that, that's going well. Um, and then I always try to tell people, you really should 
and now this is a big wash, but you shouldn't go two more than more than two uh, inches before you think about your edges. So I want all this soft edge. So before it gets rock hard, I got to get in there and soften it. I want that to be a transition, not a, I mean, it'd be nice, but that wasn't my original plan. I wasn't going to do that. Okay, soft, 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 soft. That's good. We'll get that later. Um, I can even come back and give a little more when it's a little drier. Keep in mind how wet things are, what they're going to do. Now let's get into this lavender down in here. This is alizarin crimson. And if I add a little bit of deoxidine purple, come on. Ooh, it's looking really nice. It just um, shifts that red just enough. And I'm going to come right over the feet. I have to admit, I wish I lived where you guys live. I would be coming to your meetings and painting with you. Oh my gosh, that sounds like so much fun. We don't have quite the art community here, but we're making it. And I'm going to use a little bit of opera. I don't know if you guys like, you, you guys, if you like opera, um, I don't mean the music, but it's a wonderful pink. And I have to admit, I haven't jumped in with all the different uh, art supplies. I mean, the colors, oh my gosh, they're amazing what's out there. Haven't done that. But um, opera came on the scene, what, it's been, what, 30 years now? <laughs> but when it did come on the scene, I was absolutely thrilled with it. And it's been part of my palette forever. Oh, yes, so, I love opera pink. When I discovered that, it was like, oh, yes. Yes, yes. Where have you so been all my life? OK, now the sky, I love cerulean blue. Um, that looks like I could throw in some cobalt. Do I have cobalt? Yes. Cobalt. Yeah. Come on, cobalt. And it looks richer, though, than that, doesn't it? Yeah, maybe like that. Getting some grains. And I'm going to start in this corner. And at this point, I haven't deviated much from the design of the um, color layout. But we're going to get there in just a few seconds. Let me get the values pretty close to what I want. Let's see more of this. There was a wonderful guy. I don't think he's with us anymore. Tony Couch. Um, years and years ago, he came and did a demo in Montana. I think it was. No, it was in Colorado. I don't remember. And. Uh, all I can remember is I was mesmerized. He was, he had the painting vertical. And he painted this whole great big painting vertical. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've died and gone to heaven. Um, because everything moves down, you know. So he was kind of, he started at the bottom of the painting, and then if he wanted it to move, that's when he had it at the uh brought it up at the top. That was pretty amazing. Okay, so I think things are going along pretty nicely. I'm getting a little bit of shadow over on the uh, circle, and I think I'll just go ahead and bring that down a little bit. 
doesn't matter if I go over the uh, little bird here. Okay, now you notice I switched brushes to my happy brush. I'm going to go a little bit darker. You see my palette? Uh, it's there. Okay. A little bit darker and some more color in here. What do you call that shape of the brush? This is a dagger. Oh, okay. It's a dagger and it, um, this company, now it's uh, Cornell, I think, makes it. The original dagger that I got was wonderful, but I think they sold out to Cornell. I don't know how they did it, but next thing you know, I was telling people and they were going, ah, uh -huh, I can't find it anywhere. So I think it's Cornell. And there's several companies that, I know Cheap Joe's has it. Um, a lot of other ones. Okay, now. I haven't done the bird yet, but I am going to paint some water on, paint some paint on. I want this, whoops, like that. I want this to be noisy, remember? Noisy dawn, right? So I'm, I'm using watermarks, because the paper, the paper's still damp, and I'm getting some watermarks in here. And then, I don't know, this is old hat to you guys, but I'm going to use saran wrap to get some textures. Oh, what I just did, I brought that blue all the way down. Don't want that. Okay, now saran wrap. I'm going to put my saran wrap on. Okay, so if you, you know, saran wrap, you can bunch it up, you can crunch it, you can do all kinds of wonderful things once it's down. You do, you do know that, right? Um, get another piece. So you can kind of see where you're headed. It's not a mystery. I can see these big, noisy shapes, the birds cawing. This is dry, which is what I want. I don't want this all over. As soon as I get this done, I'm going to show you the, the most fantastic plastic wrap container in the whole world. Okay, and then I'm going to get some coming off into here. Okay, so at this point, I get a book. This is a ancient book. This is a 18, uh, 1983, I think, 84, Maxine Masterfield, incredible. And she's gonna be my weight. And I'm gonna set this aside. And this is another great book. Um, it's Watercolors at Work. This is from 1973, I think. Some, something like that. And it's all these different watercolors. And that was at the beginning of my career. And I went bonkers over watching all, looking at all these, you know, that was before YouTube, that was before everything. Nobody was on TV except, uh, you know, maybe some people. So anyway, this is the same painting. And I'm going to pick it off. And look at the noise. Look at the motion. Just going from this, which is kind of a quiet, to this guy is driving me crazy. He's making so much noise, right? So this is just what I wanted. Now I'm going to go back in, and I'm going to finish the bird. I don't have to stay with what I was thinking it was going to be. I might now respond to this and say, what would be the best thing? Well, maybe the best thing would be for the head of the bird to stay orange. 
big orange. See yeah, how this can go to this is a nice little point. What's the face look like? Okay. That can be orange too because then I'm going to go darker. All right. And then I'm going to get into um, burnt sienna. Here, actually, I'm going to stick with that idea of the orange. I never would have left watercolors. I was so in love with watercolors, but then I married Howard Friedland, and oh my gosh, his oil painting, the thick gooey, you know, you could do a stroke and it was three dimensional, you know, stood up, and I. I just was absolutely fascinated and I kept thinking, huh, wonder who I would be if I were an oil painter. And um, that was the last thing that I said before I started taking, I took a workshop with um, Shui Tu. He's, he was the president of OPA. And then I studied with, uh, his name skip uh, Mort Morton no not Morton um uh, I'll think of it the great uh, oil painter out in, well where you live um can't think of it maybe it'll come to me later anyway I'm slowly transitioning this brown but I became so in love with uh the thick gooey stuff and I do start them a lot like a watercolor you know I'll get thin washes underneath um kind of like toning the canvas before I get started and boy I just love both mediums now and they both teach me things okay now I'm getting into this and I want that transition to, transition to happen so I'm going to go back and start introducing some purple to this little guy, but I want him to dissolve. I don't want him to be real dark. I'm going to have the darkness that's going to be up here. All this was thought out, right? Right. Soft edges, if possible. Put a little foot in there, two feet. But I want to deviate from this and, and go back to being inspired by this as well and just see what I can come up with to make it more exciting. Is his body also saying, call, call, get up, get up, it's morning. Go feed, go put food in the bird feeder. We have hummingbirds. Oh my gosh. That's a whole experience that I've never had before. And you said you're in Arkansas? Arkansas, yeah. I didn't have, a, probably some neighbors had them in Bozeman, but I just never, you know, just didn't get around to that part of the life. And But here, oh, gee, they come around whether you feed them or not. And they're so wonderful, just... Sweet little guys. Okay, so I'm just going to give a suggestion. Remember, we want to be artists of mystery. So this might be a little too hard edge right here. This is a little too hard edge. See how I used that toilet paper? Just tiptoe around. Maybe we have this drag off a little bit. Now, let's 
So I'm curious, how often do you have to replace your to- your roll of toilet paper? Oh my gosh, this gets just gross, but it dries. So it dries really hard. Yeah. It still works. You still can touch it. Oh, but as okay. I was telling Michelle, if you're out on location and you're painting and this is covered with paint and it's sitting next to you, it looks so gross. And the public will go, oh my gosh, what is that? <laughs> you know, it's not paint. No. Anybody have any questions? No? I have not seen any in the chat. Okay. Probably this is uh, something that you guys do all the time. Um, Plan your paintings so that you don't have to think. It's like, um, we really play a game of chess when we paint. We, um, a very good chess player, I forget how many moves ahead they've already thought about. Well, this is another trick. Get a um, Q-tip, and some of them are soft and some of them have hard edges. And I can just come in here and come on, suck it up. Suck it right up. See that? Just barely touch. And that wet, gooey thing that was coming out, which it wouldn't have been a bad thing. I mean, it could look like feathers. Um, it's just kind of snarfed up now. Okay, so there are some questions here now. Okay. Uh- Lauren would like to know, um, I'm not sure if I missed something, but was the circle for the sun done completely freehand or was there a tool used? Oh, yeah, you must have missed something. Okay, remember these guys, that I, were you here when I talked about these guys? Um, just save a collection of these plastic things and that's that one right there, or was it this one? I think it was this one. I just put it down, drew around it so that I didn't have to use a compass, you know, because that's going to poke a hole in the middle. So save, save these things, save um, vitamin caps. I think this is an apple. You can get applesauce out of this. This was a uh, guacamole. I have no idea what that is. Um, this might have been some kind of soy sauce or something. But save these because then you don't have to put those those holes in your picture. Now, uh, did that help? Yes. Now, there's another question here. Was the paint dry before you took off the saran wrap? And then what yes. brand of wrap do you use? Oh, I was going to show you that. That's so great. I'll show you what not to use. This is a generic one and it's miserable to get out and miserable to tear, right? Right. Now you're all going to go to your Costco store. Can you see? I'll put it right here. See this one? Kirkland, that's, that's Costco. You lift it like this, you pull it over, you slide, it goes down, you slide it, voila. Look at that. Mm. It's in, and it's really nice. It doesn't, it's, it's not obnoxious. I love this. And if you don't live near Costco, you can go to the Costco.com, uh, I think, and you can order it online. That's what I'm going to have to do because and this is 750 square feet. Let me tell you, that's been lasting for a long, 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 long time. Does that help? You can wrap a lot in that. <laughs> yeah, you can. A lot of paintings. Um, yeah. So then it's just a matter of how much you want to detail this out. And I think what I'm going to do is I like how it gets richer up in here. And more detail. more dark. I'm letting this dry a little bit so I can develop the um, mouth. 
So Carol says, um, I'm glad you talked about deciding what emotion I want in the painting, picking colors and value with this in mind. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Carol. Yes. Um, you, you know, it's a, such a simple thing. Just ask yourself as soon as you pick a subject, why did I pick it? And what am I feeling? And, you know, the, the, the tendency is to say, oh, it's because it has a nice tree. Yeah, okay, it is a nice tree. But what are you feeling from that tree? That's going to make a huge difference in the decisions that you're making. Now, remember, I'm trying to get this bird to look like it's really noisy. And at the same, which the saran wrap almost did all the work for me. Um, yeah, the saran wrap, you waited till it was totally dry to remove it. Is that right? Yeah, I did that. Um, actually, I did that this morning. And I just left it underneath here. And because I knew it wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to take it off. And it would stay if I did it, demonstrated it, and did it at the same time. There wouldn't be enough time for that to dry. It really needs to dry for about at least 20 minutes. Um, if you pick it up before it's not dry, all these edges are just going to dissolve back into the, uh, the rest of the painting. Gotcha. So, yeah. Oh, now, I, I noticed that the um, the edges or the marks that are made by the saran wrap, they appear to be around the moon or sun or whatever. Is right. that because th this moon or sun was dry when you put the saran down? I mean, why, yes. why is it that you Remember don't see the marks okay. on there? Right. That was the very first thing I did, and it was a very thin wash, and then I didn't go back. So that meant that this had a chance to dry before, and then I came in and I put all this extra water on top. Remember, I added some more paint on it. So this kept staying wet and this was dry. So when I put the saran wrap on, it didn't touch the sun. Now, what you could do, there is masking fluid that I you know, I don't know. You could you can actually um, take a piece of thick plastic like from a plastic folder and you can cut a circle out and you can use masking fluid and glue it down and then paint around it and then pull it up and pull the masking fluid off but if if this is dry it doesn't hurt now if if this wasn't dry the saran wrap anything that came over this would pull some of the blue into here and it actually would be pretty cool. Um, I was thinking that we would have, we had a little bit of overlap here, but I was thinking that we might have a, a just a ghost or two of this coming in through here, but no mm. such luck. Pat would like to know, how do you avoid blooms? Oh, I love blooms. Okay, so you don't avoid blooms. No, no, no. I look, look wait a minute, I'll show you a painting. Uh, what did I do with that painting? Oh, here they are. So, oh, I had this whole, whole section I didn't show you. So, let's, well, this is sitting there for a second. I'm going to go through this. This is um, it, just playing with your colors, what you're gonna do, just like I did on the side of the painting. This is, let me set this down. Uh, this is so helpful for you in setting your color tones. Um, take a piece of paper and just play with the saran wrap. You can see this could be ocean, could be mountains, mountains this way, maybe mountains or ocean, oceans. Um, this is interesting. This came because the paper had been uh, stored in a place that was too damp. So there had there must have been water. Can you see that? Inside the, the paper. And that's so where weird. it came from. You can get that from stamping paper towels too. Um, we did that one. Blooms. Practice making blooms because they are, no, get the painting here. 
when you want them, you know how to make them. See? They're wonderful. They draw a lot of attention, but it's if you're thinking about your stroking and you're knowing that you're adding water to whatever is the washes, you're literally painting a bloom by your stroke. Don't go back over it, but just let it, there's enough water that it just pushes. If it's real wet and you do this, the bloom might dissolve away. See, some of this is dissolved away. But if it's semi-dry and you, the only way, it's like riding a bike, the only way you can figure it out is to just do some of these bloom exercises, blooming exercises. And um, it's another saran wrap exercise. See how, how you can see what it's gonna do. Um, this is really fun. Try just doing a, a montage of color and then putting these saran wraps in and you actually squeeze and pinch and get the shapes that you want. This is, this is also, now this is on um, that Canson paper. So it's a little squirrelier. This is Canson also, and you can see how, wow, what a texture that got. You know, hmm. just, just experimenting to see. And then this is, ah, I don't remember, some kind of a bubble wrap or something. But it was, oh, I know, I crinkled it up. I crunched it all up in my hand. Then I put it down and then I put the weight on it. And this is a good thing for you to do too. Stamping, you know, some paper towels have a, a real vivid stamping. So if you're doing a window, curtains, you can just, fold your paper towel like it's curtains and push it into that wet wash. This is um, saran wrap. This is alcohol. This is watermarking. This is corrugated cardboard. I don't know if we even get that anymore, but um, that's great stuff. This is a fun one that was done using uh, just kind of just taking the outline of the bird, putting color in, letting it go from dull to pure, muted to pure, and then pushing in saran wrap on it. It's kind of bizarre. But all this is stuff that is just plain fun to do. Oh, you saw this guy. And then this is one that is using muted to pure to uh, get your eye to go right there. Yeah. So what are we gonna do with this guy? I think I'm going to take some of this uh, netting. I'm gonna wet this just a little bit. Okay, you ready? Uh, I, I should have been more aggressive. Like, okay, I'm going to add some more paint. You know, you always hate to, it's like you're beating something. Yeah. Add more paint. And some of these should be starting to come out. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to be aggressive. Poor bird. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work. Should. Mm. I know. What did work, <laughs> but I didn't want it, is the edge of my hammer. See that? I got those up. Which is oh, up. yeah. Yeah, pushing another one. Oh, that's kind of fun. So there's still experimentation as long as you're being true to uh, too soon, maybe. Um, true to your emotion. And you know, people, when they come up to your painting, they're hoping for emotion. You know, they, they see, oh, it's a pretty scene, but a pretty scene that feels ominous or it feels happy or, you know, give them what they're, they're looking for, they're seeking. 
So um, BJ is asking, was the paper uh, drenched and stapled and then left to shrink? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, anymore you can buy blocks of paper. Yeah. Those are absolutely wonderful. But uh, again, probably old school. If I love the big sheets of paper, and I'll, like, there's actually another piece up here that's stapled down. Um, now, I do. I do have to tell you, be very careful where you store your watercolor paper. Because if you've got, some people have a, you know, kind of a under the eaves storage spot and their studio is up on the second floor and they use it. Well, if, if you open that storage spot and it's hot, I mean, really hot, your paper is, is going to be ruined. If you open it, and it gets really cold in there. And like in the winter, your paper's gonna be ruined. Now, I'm telling you this because I learned out of experience. I bought a um, huge 50 sheets of 300 pound watercolor paper. I got it from um, Meiniger's in, in uh, Colorado. And I was all excited that I had this watercolor paper and I left it in my van and I was teaching at the American, uh, not the American, um, the Loveland Art Academy. So I just left all my water, well, especially that, it was a big box, it was heavy, I had to go upstairs. So I just left that in the van. And the first week, the paper was great. And the second week, it was still okay. By the third week, I would put a stroke down. I could not blend it. I could not do anything with it. I was so unhappy. So I called up Meiniger's and I said, I'm having a really big problem. I think I got a bad batch. So he said, well, tell me about what happened. And I, I told him, I said, I don't know what's going on. And I've been painting with in watercolors for you know decades. And he said, um, where do you store it? I said, oh, it's still in the box. It's still in the box. He says, yeah, but where is the box? I said, that's in my van. Um, it's in my van. And he said, in a garage? And I said, no, no, it sits outside. He says, uh-huh. Well, your paper is getting hot, 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 because it's all sealed up during the day. And then at night, it's getting cold, cold, cold. And he says, you have changed the nature of your paper. And um, there's nothing you can do about it now. You can use it for pastels. <laughs> so on that note, I always tell everybody, don't store it, don't leave it in a hot car. If you have to, get a, a pizza bag, you know, those big pizza bags, and put your block of paper in that. Or if you have several sheets, you know, and they're pretty big. You can put it in that. If you don't have that, then wrap it in bubble wrap several times um, because just, you know, like if you really hot summer day, you get out of your car, you go in shopping or you have lunch with somebody on your way home from your class, by the time you do that a few times, you're going to end up ruining your watercolor paper. and. Um, that's that's really important to take care of that paper. Because when it works, it works, and when it doesn't, oy, oy, oy. I'm still not happy with that eye. Maybe you need a little bit more of a feather here. Yeah, oh, that helps. So it's this little bitty tweak, 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 tweak have something going on. Oh, that's a little bit of that stuff I stamped in there, isn't it? Yeah, didn't really work, but I wanted to get kind of that little feather collar that he has there, just ever so much suggested. Come on down the wing. But 
I want to be also a little bit of mystery here. I don't want to tell too much. Don't really like this shape. You know, look at your shapes. Um, sometimes, like that shape was just irritating me. Get very sensitive to your shapes. And this spacing in here is you know, less than lovely. So maybe I'll come in with. Uh, I was going to go orange, but I'm thinking a little bit of lavender might. Let's see what happens. Yeah, oh, that's much nicer. Over the yellow. Yeah, that's a little crazy. A little crazy. I'll put a little brown in that. Okay, now I'm liking it. You know, the other thing is that you need, oops, I don't like these spots. See all those spots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Takes the emphasis off of this. I'd rather hit it there. Um, take, take your painting and um, when you get done with it, turn it against the wall or put it, keep it flat until it's dry. Um, and then after a few days, turn it around. And look at it and say, what's the first thing I notice? And um, is that what I want to notice? Because that's what people are going to see. You know, whatever it is that you saw for the first time, you have brand new eyes. Because when you're painting, you're seeing you're up too close. So the other thing is you need to step back eight feet from your painting. Um, you need to. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking into the mirror, not the mirror, the computer, and I didn't even notice how icky this is. So I'm just gonna lift it off. You can give a little haircut. Much better, huh? Doesn't that look better? I mean, I don't mind fuzzy things, but that was just too much. And I do like this kind of ghost-like feet that are happening here. I have a little water there. Um, and I purposely used a watermark here to let that the wing, the edges, the last feathers of the wing just kind of dissolve into uh, just a line. Now I really have to do something about that eye. So I'm going to take burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. If you're using black, I highly recommend that you stop using black because it's, it's a non-color. If you want to make a black, take burnt sienna. Ooh, love burnt sienna. There's so many colors out there. I have to admit, I'm old-fashioned with mine. Sometimes somebody will give me a color that I fall in love with. And then take burnt sienna, I mean, ultramarine blue, and look at, isn't that a gorgeous black? I can go all the way to a blue black or I can have a brown black. See that? Or I can introduce a strong green into it and I get an incredible forest green. None of these are dead colors, but black, when you put that in, it kills it. I used it in one of my favorite, favorite colors was Payne's Gray. And um, in the 80s, I went to Chicago and studied with Irving Shapiro at the American Academy of Art. And the first thing he did, doggone it, was take away my Payne's Gray. And I was like, what are you doing? And it was the same thing. He says, every time you darken a color, you grab that Payne's Gray and you're killing the colors. Gra darken it by taking the next dark over. For instance, if I want to darken my uh, cerulean, Bump, bump, bump. Okay, I could do that. Or I could go this way. That would make it a green dark, you know, darker green. This would make it a darker blue. Or I could keep going. Uh, if I go into this, there's too much green in that, so it's better to stay there. If I want to darken my yellow, I could go a little green. I could go to orange. I could go to burnt sienna. Okay. Um, same thing with the reds. I could go. I wanted to darken a red, but this is darker than um, cad red. That's uh, alizarin crimson. So I could go with that. 
to darken it, or I could go burnt sienna. Um, or I can mix the, if I really wanted to go dark, I could mix the burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, whoops, those two, and then add it to that. So you have all these wonderful choices. So don't use black, unfortunately. I know. I love black too. But yeah, we, we, color is our song. You know, this is uh, who we are. So, and it's not even good for um, dulling colors because then they just go flat. There's just no life to them at all. Oh, getting back to that blossoms, this is one of those times when I pushed water into this, I knew all of this was dry. So I knew it was going to form a blossom right along the edge. Because what happens is blossoms push the paint so that it forms those little, um, what's that painting? Way down here, here. See, it pushes it. It's like a little wave that comes in and pushes the paint together uh, and brushes onto, it's like a little wave. It rushes onto this drier spot and creates a, um, is, this was still pretty wet, but it groups together and creates this uh, pattern of paint getting pushed. You can see I put water down in here and you can see this little bit of interest right in here. I did it in here, but in, this was a little too dry and instead it separated the paint. See that? Just a little bit, gave a little bit of texture. Okay, how are we doing here? I think I've got a lot going on here and I still haven't done anything with the eye. I don't know whether to go dark or, okay, let's go thick, ultramarine blue and clean my brush. That's something that is so important with watercolors is to not double dip, dip your colors because pretty soon ultramarine blue looks like uh, um, burnt sienna. So you need to rinse in between. That's why it's so helpful to have this. So I don't know, I don't have that color anyplace else. I'm gonna shift it more to a burnt, dark, dark burnt sienna. And see if I can just, Yeah, just a little bit. Same thing in here. Well, I was going to tell you something else. What was that? Um, oh, yeah, this is something that you might not think about. I have on a um, neutral dark gray. And the reason when I paint that I have this is that whatever color I have on, it will influence the colors in my painting. So I, I'm one of these people that loves to wear red and bright, wonderful colors. And what it does is it bounces into my painting and influences everything that I paint. If I'm painting a yellow flower, I think it's a, I've got warmer colors than what it is. And so I might be making it cooler. You're much better off to um, wear a neutral color because it will reflect into one time I was into your painting one time I was painting next to a barn and I was right up next to the barn that was the view I wanted and um all of my colors I, I love you know I was having a great old time I got home and I thought that's weird those weren't the colors I was painting the barn was red I was standing in the shade but the barn was reflecting, was the light was hitting the barn and reflecting into my painting. And it pretty much ruined that uh, painting. And so uh, I'm very conscious of what I wear, what I'm painting, and what's influencing my work. Like for instance, in the picture of my studio, um, the window with my studio, that that is a picture because it's dark here right now. <laughs> but um, I have these wonderful trees that I look out on. I call it my treehouse studio and I absolutely love it. But 
in the summer, when I'm painting in there, I have to darken, I have to pull the blinds when I'm painting because all those green leaves. Can you flip to my studio for a second, Michelle? Sure. See what I mean? All that green in my studio influences tremendously the colors that I see on my palette and the, and the colors I put in my painting. So I pull down the shades and then it works fine. Um, so watch what you're wearing when you're painting. Uh, maybe you have a paint shirt you can remember to put on. Donna would like to know, uh, what is the green in your palette? My green, you know, uh, years ago, I started with Viridian. Viridian is a dull green. And so this is uh, Windsor, uh, Windsor Green Blue Shade. Look at that color. Isn't that just delicious? And it's it's got blue shade. Uh, on, on my other palette, I'll show you what the yellow shade looks like. That's also yummy. But that's a darker color. What did I do? Oh, it's underneath here. Okay. And but it's it's toxic. If you're doing landscapes, you don't want to make green with that or leaves or anything because it's too intense. So what you, greens should always be mixed. You want to take a blue and a yellow, and that's a really good thing for you to do too. Is to take your yellow and try it with each of your greens. Look at that, that green. That could be, whoops, can you see that? That can be grass. See that color? That could be grass. That, mm -hmm. no. Um, if I wanted to use that for the dark green, I could use a blue, that would make it very blue green, or I could just add a little bit of red to it. It's a duller, look at that. Now, that's the dark grass. Versus that, I don't know if you can tell the difference on that, but it it's a duller green than the intense green over here, or burnt, a little burnt sienna into it. The other thing when you're painting is you, you it's really important to consider your light source. Is my paint? Oh, I was going to show you. This is the yellow green that is, is very nice, but it too is extremely Windsor green, yellow shade. It's extremely um, strong. Mm -hmm. So yeah. mix, make a color chart of how many ways can I, how many, can I use every single one of these colors to make green? Yes, that's incredible, but you can do it. Now I must nest around here so much, but I don't like this face anymore. So let's see. So we've got about five more minutes. Five more minutes, okay. I could stay with you guys forever. It's so much fun. We're having fun with you too, but isn't it getting kind of late there? Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's the whole thing about Zoom in these time zones. But you know what? I, uh, I When I'm painting, I'm so happy. And when I'm teaching, I'm so happy. So right now, time doesn't exist. It's just joy. I'm trying to get that little tip to disappear a little bit. There we go. Okay, so still not real keen on this eye. Do you ever use white? Uh, no, white, you know, I have it way, way, way in, in my beginning painting. Um, and somebody pointed out that it looked like a Band-Aid. It never really looks like the paper. But I'll tell you what is really great for getting white. Uh, do I have it right here? Let me see, I might have one here. This is fun for stamping. I'm sure you all you all know that. Since I moved down here, that's my new language is y'all. Um, it's called the magic eraser. Oh, I don't have one. 
And it's something that you use for scrubbing on your walls. You know, to get the kids' kids' fingerprints off and stuff like that. And uh, you just squeeze it. Let's, I'll pretend this is a magic eraser, okay? This, you squeeze it in water, squeeze all the water out of it. You just I tear off a piece of it. And then you can just rub, 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 and it just lifts it right off. You can go right down to the actual surface of the paper. Um, oh, you know what I forgot to do? Holy smokes. I don't know if this will work. I'm gonna do it right now. I made this great little channel in here. Darn it. You can put two rows of tape. I'm gonna pull the tape off in a minute. I have because I have to run out of I'm running out of time, right? This one got some yellow because I was a little wide in my stroke, so that's good. I might strengthen that a little bit. Mm, that's probably a little too strong. And then some pink. Pink, pink, pink. In the corner. I was supposed to remember to paint outside of the tape. That's something I never do. <laughs> but I wanted to show you this is such a fun technique for um, adding a little pizzazz to your painting. Okay, I'm go a little bit. More purple, turn the corner, come up here, get some orange, orange, orange. Maybe that's a little bright, but that's okay. And then some blue. Look. And now I'm coming back here. Do you ever use metallics? Um, you know, I've been I've done it a couple times with oils. I haven't done it with watercolors, but uh, I'm very fascinated with that. There's a gal that paints uh, oil painting on gold on gold and silver. I said, wow, that's an expensive art hobby. Um, mm. But they're stunning, and then you can take the gold leaf, you know, you can actually take your watercolor paper. Now gold, gold leaf, you'd have to be painting with um, a smoother surface or it'll get all wrinkled, uh, you know, lumpy, but, um, and textured, but you can actually take a section and rub, like for instance, if I wanted this to be a, a really gold leaf sun, I can actually go in there and do that. And, mm -hmm. uh, with real gold leaf. Amazing what you can do. Okay, so are we out, out of time? Yes. Yeah, time is so up. Let me, let me show you this. This is the fun part. Huh, look at that. So for those of you that stayed to the very last minute, this is your dessert. Very cool. So it's so out. it was two layers of tape. I, I mean, two skinny tape. Of tape. Skinny tape. I taped off the size of the painting, and then I uh, cut it so that they ended together, and then I taped on the outside, and voila! So now if you get a, a mat. You just have to come like maybe to there or you can come all the way up to the, the red or to that inside one and you've still got a mat within a mat. Um, for those of you that are uh, selling at art fairs or you wanna give a present, you wanna do a watercolor on a card and you do this on the front, you know, just around your, oh my gosh, it just, 
It looks fabulous. Oh, yeah. yeah. So what kind of tape is that? Um, I use artist tape. It's a white tape. It's, um, I got another room. Do not use capital D, capital N masking tape. Masking tape has acid in it. And when you use that, it'll look fine when you take it off. But, you know, two or three years down the road, every place where the tape was has turned orange. So do not use masking tape. If you wanted to, like if I wanted to mask out that Oh, that's another thing that you can use. If I wanted to mask out this sun, I could have used um, shelf paper, shell, you know, clear shelf paper, cut the circle out, tape it on. What, what I would do is I would first do the wash and then let that dry the next day, come back and um, cut out a piece of uh, clear shelf paper, plastic. Rub that down because this is all nice and dry or wait a couple days if you want to and then paint around it uh, so I can get this and then pull that off and um, you got it. Ooh, I don't like this. Wait a minute. So um, can you send a photo of your completed Hey, yes. you email it to us so we can include that with the video on YouTube because this is oh, going yeah. to be on, there, uh, okay. on our oh, YouTube okay. channel. Um, I have some of my, you know, I have people all over the country. I sent a newsletter out that said I was doing this and, you know, the ones in um, California were thrilled. The ones in uh, on the East Coast were not so thrilled at the time. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> That's not a problem. I'll I'll find out what the link is. So, um, how soon does that come on? Yeah, we'll we'll get you the link, uh, and it probably will get up this weekend. Okay. Oh, that's great. Well, it's it's uh, so exciting. I've got to fix this. I there we go. Now he looks like a cartoon, but that's better than being blind. Um, it's so exciting to be able to do this for you. And, you know, we are one big family. We speak the same language. We know the language of the brush. And um, everybody has a different signature. It's the way you hold the brush. It's the brushes that you use. It's how much water you use. It's, and, and that is who you are and lean into that. But always lean into the emotion that you're feeling and uh, identify it and go for it. That looks like a noisy crow. And these other ones that I was working on, I mean, and that's the colors. I wanted some of this conflict in color. Yeah. Um, they're still harmonious, but uh, I got the, the feeling. So thank you. Uh, All right. Thank you so much, Susan. We've really enjoyed this. And oh, uh, you. we'll look forward to revisiting it on um, YouTube and um, hope to see you again. Oh, yeah, I hope so, too. And um, hope to see you at a show sometime. And, uh, you know, we, it's amazing how we artists are like gypsies. We go all over the country and the world. And, and uh, join us in the Dolomites next year. That'd be fun. <laughs> yes, it would. Might just have to you know try what? that. Visit my website. If you want to stay in contact with me, I have a newsletter that I talk about things that's going on. Um, and, you know, if you've got a question, call me up, you know, it's, we're okay. We're family now. Great. I appreciate that. What's your night now? Bye, Donna. Thank you so much for suggesting that I do a demo. Thanks so much, Susan. It was great.